Counting history is an unusual discipline. Its roots date back to the end of the 19th century, and in particular to the work of two scholars, Fabio Bester and Alberto Ciccarelli, in the early 20th century. In the 30 or so years that uh, their work was published, these two scholars defined what accounting history was. They were looking at the use of double entry bookkeeping and accounting in Italy in the medieval period. And it is widely acknowledged that that is where the roots of modern accounting lie. The conclusions they drew influenced all researchers thereafter. Bester defined what you should be looking for if you want to conclude the double entry method of bookkeeping was in use. Ciccarelli looked in more detail at what was done when early forerunners of balance sheets were prepared by large Tuscan firms. Their work influenced all the accounting historians who looked at the medieval period thereafter. Some were able to detach themselves from it, but most did not. They stuck with what those scholars had concluded. And one thing that is very evident, if you look at the accounting history literature, is that accounting historians don't tend to read the literature of economic history. The very little awareness of what was written, or has been written, about that period and accounting in that period. This paper brings that in to add the context in order to develop and draw conclusions. The result is a literature that is very much founded in work done before 1930. That work uses very little context in concluding what is being done and why. It has a view on it that is very much focused on the present. It's teleological, Whiggish. It looks at what was happening in that period and looks for signs of things that we do today. And the closer that what was done then was to what is done today, the better it was. Now, in addition to that, there was an assumption in the literature that we had the beginnings of everything then and here it was. and. Scholars looking at later periods have just looked back at medieval times and have concluded, well, this is what we know from those scholars, so therefore it must be right, so we'll just move forward from that. Very few have challenged what they wrote or their conclusions. And yet, the economic historians who've looked at the same period, the same account books, have a very different perspective. They have been very critical of that work. So which is right? the accounting historians, or the economic historians. And economic historians have been joined by historians with the same view. This paper follows on from that theme. This paper looks at what is arguably the most important document in the history of accounting. It's a document that is revered, its author is revered, uh, looked on as being the father of accounting, because it contained instructions in how to do the technique of double entry bookkeeping. Double entry bookkeeping was used by Italian wholesale merchants in medieval period from at least the 13th century. The document that this paper is about was published in print in 1494. It was written by Luca Pacioli, a Franciscan friar who had spent six years of his youth as a merchant's apprentice in Venice. He was a mathematician and teacher and he put this document into a compendium of practical mathematics, mathematics for business, Summa Arithmetica. The document is called De Computus et Scripturis. It's 27 pages long and it was first rediscovered in the 19th century by Germans, Italians and Russians. 
It was translated and has been translated into at least 14 different languages and there are five English translations. And those English translations have been the foundation of virtually everything written in English by scholars of accounting history when they have been discussing medieval accounting, early modern accounting. And what the treatise contains is considered to be, for want of a better word, the gospel on how accounting was done in medieval Italy. What this paper will present is some comments on the accounting history literature and an overview of what this document really was because accounting historians believe it was simply a manual on how to do double entry bookkeeping and as I will show it was rather more than just a manual on double entry bookkeeping and it was also not about accounting it was about bookkeeping. There are many problems in the medieval accounting history literature. It is predominantly teleological. So accounting historians look at artifacts from various periods and try and relate them to how accounting is done now. There's an assumption that there was a progression, a Darwinistic progression over the centuries that led us to where we are now. This is an assumption that was abandoned by economic historians in the 1920s. The accounting historians have stuck to it. It's an approach that ignores context almost completely if you read the accounting history literature on medieval Europe. It does not seek any explanations. In that literature, bookkeeping is the same thing as accounting. Absolutely the same thing, when in that period it was absolutely not the same thing. Accounting didn't really exist. Accounting is financial reporting, income statements, balance sheets. Bookkeeping is recording the data of transactions. The accounting history literature is very resistant to new interpretation and it is predominantly present-minded, which means that those that write struggle to separate themselves from the present when they're writing about the past, particularly the medieval past. Most of the medieval accounting history literature published since 1900 has been antiquarian. There's nothing wrong with that, but mixed in with a teleological focus, which screws, squint the view that you have of that history. The focus is largely on how close medieval and early modern accounting practice resonates with modern accounting practice. And you will see many heavily cited papers in this literature that do that. It's been accused of being Whiggish and swirling around in a vacuum that pays very little attention to the actual books of account, of which there are hundreds. You'll find very few articles or books by accounting historians that look at or discuss medieval accounting and actually present examples of it. Context is almost completely missing. So understanding of what was being done does not exist. There's this desire simply to take what was done and compare it to the present and determine whether or not it has improved and when it improved. If you look at the existing records, particularly in Tuscany, but also elsewhere in Italy, you can learn a lot that is not in the accounting history literature. The accounting historians view Pacioli's treatise as the definition. And because they view it that way, you do not need, therefore, to look at the real things that are going on. But it was a textbook in a book of mathematics written for merchants so that they could be proficient in their trade. And what textbook do we know of that is actually a faithful definition or representation of actual practice? It's very simplified. Context is missing from our literature. The context has hardly ever been investigated or applied to Pacioli's treatise by accounting historians. The treatise is not understood by accounting historians and by definition, therefore, it is not understood by accountants or accounting scholars. Misunderstand its purpose. Misunderstand what it contains. The literature will not tell you why he wrote it because that's very difficult to do when you don't know what it contains. Who was it for? The literature has that very wrong. Does he tell us? One thing that I have to make clear is that bookkeeping differs from accounting. 
the accounting process uses the books kept by the bookkeeper to prepare the end of year accounting statements and accounts. Bookkeeping just records what's happened. And if you look in the medieval account books, you'll see that they don't get closed very often. And when they do, it's usually because they're full, unless they are large scale partnerships in Tuscany or religious institutions. But Venetian wholesale merchants did not close their account books and prepare accounting type of information or material. When you separate the bookkeeping from accounting, clarity begins to emerge. You begin to see what is there as opposed to assuming what is there. Double entry bookkeeping is used by medieval wholesale merchants, Italian wholesale merchants, to facilitate operating in a credit-based economy. Its use gave them control over debt and control over their agents, factors and partners. In doing so, it served the needs of business. That's why the merchants used it, to make their businesses more efficient, to control risk. Accounting, on the other hand, served the needs of owners and even those large-scale Tuscan partnerships that had accounting, like Dettini in Prato and his various branches and the Medici and those that came from an earlier generation, they were very much to enable the owners to get their share of what had happened during the time they were owners. That's why the accounting was done. You compare that to the majority, the vast majority of businesses, they weren't bothered about doing that, so they didn't do accounting. So what does he tell us? Well, in order to find out, my colleague and I undertook a study which used literally hermeneutics, supported by 16th century dictionaries and etymology dictionaries, to translate the first chapter of Pacioli's treatise in a way that's never been done before. It contains instructions in bookkeeping. It does not contain instructions in accounting. The double entry bookkeeping in Venice was done differently from elsewhere, and that spread across Europe through printed manuals in the 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, and 19th century. And the approach they took was the one that Pacioli describes, the Venetian approach, with a journal, a ledger, and a day book or memorandum book for all the details. That system did not exist anywhere else. There were no large-scale partnerships of the type that were typical in Tuscany, in Venice, and it was Venice that Bacioli was writing about and for. In 15th century Venice, the state, the church, probably, and some charities used double entry. Double entry is a technique whereby every transaction is recorded twice, once as a debit, once as a credit. If you receive cash, your cash balance increases, you debit it. If you have sold goods, then you reduce the quantity of goods in your records by crediting their account. They were all required to report regularly and audited, and that's why they used a form of accounting that provided them with control as described earlier. Businesses had no such control over them. There was no periodicity, no requirement to, to prepare financial statements like we have today on a regular basis, none of that. And double entry was used by Venetian wholesale businesses. The trade in Venice was conducted in one place, the Rialto. It all used the same money of account. Retail trade in Venice was conducted elsewhere, and it used a different money of account. In Venice, in the Rialto market, in order to survive, merchants had to be seen to conform. Otherwise, they would not be able to participate. If they had to be successful, if they were to be successful, they had to manage their affairs in the most efficient, effective way. Now, you can get all that information from the economic history literature. But accounting historians don't look at that literature, so they're unaware of it. They had to keep de detailed records of their transactions, their contracts, some notarized, others not, their correspondence, promissory notes, and any bills of exchange they issued. So they had to keep very good records, not just of debt, absolutely everything to do with their business. And they had to be able to put their hands on it straight away. Otherwise, they would not be able to sustain their business in the long term. 
At that time, there was a shortage of cash for the volume of wholesale trade that took place. So the wholesale merchants in Venice did everything possible to avoid using cash, and did so with the assistance of the Banca del Giro. They positioned themselves beside the Rialto market. So in this virtually cashless trading environment, they needed to know what credit they had, not just with their banks, but with other merchants, so that they could use it effectively and get fully involved in the clearing process that was an essential part of the Rialto market, so their records had to be perfect. In order for that to be straightforward and avoid disputes, the process of trade and the clearing process that followed required that a consistently applied method was used for keeping account, and that was double entry. Otherwise, disputes would have been frequent, settlement would have been disrupted, and the credit-based economic structure of the marketplace would have struggled to cope effectively. The wholesale merchants also understood the supporting evidence that may have been provided to them, and they knew where to find their supporting evidence if required. And for obvious reasons, any merchant who lacked double entry account books and did not keep his other records in good order would struggle to enter, never mind survive in this market. Looking at this counterfactually, had double entry not been the norm in the wholesale market in Venice? How could it have flourished to the extent that Venice was the centre of European trade? in which credit offset, that's transferring from one account to another, and bank transfers were dominant facilitating forces. You can't do this with the simpler versions or forms of bookkeeping. So that was the environment for which Pacioli wrote his treatise. The wholesale merchants of Venice were from the patrician class, the upper class, the merchant class that ran the Venetian Republic. They aspired to be successful merchants, but they had neither the maths nor the double entry bookkeeping they needed, and Pacioli provided them both in that one book, Summa Arithmetica, printed in 1494. He also provided them with the instructions, the other records they needed to keep. So, Pacioli's treatise is a treatise on how to keep business records. It is not a treatise on how to do double entry bookkeeping and nothing else. It's a manual on how to maintain all records. We looked at five English translations the only five, and five other translations, German, French, Spanish, Italian, and Russian. None of them, and no others we're aware of, has written about the treatise, has defined it in the way that I have just done. Yet anyone who reads the treatise carefully, objectively, and with an open mind will appreciate that it does go beyond the keeping accounts, dealing with also, for example, the maintaining of records of letters, mail pouches, bills of exchange, promissory notes, and so on. Translations, five in, in English, one in Italian, and others in at least 12 other languages. All of the translations we have looked at differ from each other. All the English translations omit text without any indication. All the English translations add text that is not in the original. And I'm just talking about one chapter. The four transcriptions are all flawed. Understanding the language is hard, as is reading the text. This is what the text looks like printed in terms of the um, abbreviations that are embedded in it. Very, very difficult to read, very easy to make mistakes, and there are typos scattered throughout it. If you look at it, you'll see, if you can read the Italian and read the text, that there are even parts where the typesetting leads you to think that the words are not what they really are. So, for example, at the very end of this extract you've got here, you have e cosa via, fare. And the far and the e are separated when they should be together. Within the treatise, Pacioli does tell us why he did it. And only for this reason do I include this treatise, so that for any of their occurrences, that's the wholesale merchants' occurrences, this book can help them with the methods of keeping accounts and records as well as reckonings. And you won't find that translation in the ones that exist. I actually define three qualities a merchant, a real merchant, had to have. First was about funds. Second requirement, two parts. You had to be a, a good ragionieri and a, a quick computista. These are the translations of the five English translators. Ragionieri 
in the modern world is an accountant. Slightly misspelled. Those days, that's not. That's not what it meant. Yet all of the first four translators used that, either as an accountant or a bookkeeper. And Cogbatista was looked on as being a mathematician, bookkeeper, mathematician, or an accounting system. All of those are wrong. On Gebsattel in 1994, produced the correct translation of them both. Giesbeek's 1914 translation is the one that's primarily used by English language accounting historians. Third quality, that as affairs are arranged in good order so they can quickly obtain details of everything concerning their debt and also their credit because concerning anything else, trade has no need. So he's not here indicating a merchant needs to use double entry, but that's what most of the translators believed. He's talking about the records as a whole. And if you look at the last phrase there in blue, que cerca altro non se tende al tráfico, it was translated in this way. Two of the five translators didn't translate it, didn't include it in their translation. Carlo Antonori in 1919, his Italian translation, certainly included it and just put the same sense or meaning into his translations we have here. But you can see the other English language ones. Now anyone writing about Pacioli would have first gone to Giesbeck, which has been available electronically for the most of the last 20 years, if not longer, on the internet. Crivelli is a book. It's not available electronically. Now there's Brown and Johnson. Cripps is available online, but only recently. So where would that, uh, a scholar have gone? Well, it probably would have would have purchased or borrowed a copy of Crivelli, Brown and Johnson. Crivelli comes close to the meaning, Brown and Johnson don't. So in terms of the second and third requirement, we took the five English translations together first, and we put a tick where they've actually got it right. And as you can see, in terms of well-ordered records, only Crivelli in 1924 had that one right. And if you look at the other translations we looked at, the German, the French, the Italian, the Spanish, the Russian, they are much better. We begin to see that people are beginning to really understand what Pacioli is saying. And even they didn't understand Ragionieri. So the paper makes it clear that these were the qualities of a merchant, not a bookkeeper or an accountant that Pacioli was talking about. And if you look at the accounting history literature, that is not what it appears to be. There you'll find that there's an assumption he's talking about a bookkeeper. It reveals that Pacioli was not saying a merchant had to know how to do double entry. He was saying a merchant who sought to operate in the Venetian wholesale marketplace had to conform and keep all his fares in good order and his account books in double entry. But they could have been maintained by someone else on his behalf. But he had to be able to read them because he needed to check the entries in the bank and in the other merchants' ledgers. This clarification had support a view that double entry bookkeeping was normal practice among the wholesale merchants and international merchants in Venice. Frederick Lane concluded this in the 1940s. Accounting historians still don't think that this is the case. The Venetian Journal was a legally recognised record, so why grant something legal status was rarely used? The journal was used, and Pacioli was describing the system that was in Venice, where you had a journal dedicated to being the conduit for every entry made in the ledger, which is the account book from which all of the, the, the debts and so on can be calculated. All surviving Venetian medieval wholesale merchants' account books are in double entry. Again, you won't find that in the accounting history literature. Talienti, who wrote and published a textbook on double entry bookkeeping in 1525 and another in single entry bookkeeping at the same time, makes it clear double entry was a form of bookkeeping used in this marketplace, the wholesale market. It would have been impossible for anyone to have operated in that marketplace without double entry. And why do we know that Patchouli was writing for that marketplace? the wholesale marketplace because he used the money of account of wholesale business in Venice. 
not the retail one. This raises awareness that keeping orderly records of everything what was, was what was important. For the obvious reasons that if all our merchants' affairs were not in order, it would be very difficult to trade effectively and to maintain respect in the case of dispute. But double entry was only part of that, and both Pacioli and his predecessor, Benedetto Cotrulli, who wrote on the art of trade in 1458, and included five pages on bookkeeping, double entry bookkeeping in that book, which was in manuscript form at the time and wasn't printed for another hundred years. They both placed much emphasis on the need for records kept in orderly fashion. Cotrulli digresses into that or expands into that in the last part of his chapter on double entry bookkeeping. And Pacioli does as well towards the end of his treatise. So why is this important? Double entry also made it easy to identify debtors and creditors and the amounts involved. Wholesale merchants in a credit-based economy needed to know this. He also needed the other records that provided the evidence to support any claims he had or to refute any claims other people brought to him. And this is what Pacioli is telling us when he wrote this, that the third thing needed is that his affairs are arranged in good order. That has been completely misunderstood by the accounting historians. Pacioli did not describe or instruct in accounting because Venetian wholesale merchants did not do accounting. They did bookkeeping in double entry and used the entries in the accounts to exercise control. They did not need financial reporting to meet the needs of their business. Double entry did that. And that is something that the accounting history literature is completely unaware. It's a difficult document to read. It's difficult to understand. None of the English language translations is reliable. Present-mindedness dominates all the translations we looked at, and it dominates the literature about medieval accounting or bookkeeping in the accounting history literature and the early modern literature in accounting history on the same theme. Of the ten translations we examined, the Spanish one and the Italian one are, we believe, better than the others. But all ten of the translations are flawed, and if anyone wants to really understand that treatise that is revered by the accounting historians, they need to look at the original. Because there are things in that original treatise that are not translated, that are not included, that are omitted because they're difficult to understand, and are mistranslated because they are difficult to read and understand. And until that happens, accounting history positions regarding medieval bookkeeping and accounting is on very weak foundations.